Good afternoon, everyone. This is Katie Cook from Adirondack Health Institute. Welcome to the July Telehealth Learning Collaborative. It is 1.58, so I just want to give folks a few more minutes to hop on the line. Um, so just bear with me. We'll take about two or three more minutes and we'll get started. Um, if you haven't done so, please make sure that you put in your audio pin followed by the pound sign as I can open up your line for questions after the presentation or after um, some of our state representatives have a chance to speak. So again, make sure you enter that audio pin that should be up on your screen. Thank you. All right, so it's 201, so I'd like to get started. Uh, again, this is Katie Cook from Adirondack Health Institute. For those who might be new to the Telehealth Learning Collaborative, welcome. I am the Telehealth Project Manager here at AHI, and um, AHI partners with Fort Drum Regional Health Planning Organization on the North Country Telehealth Partnership. The Telehealth Learning Collaborative is every other month. So our next call will not be till September. Um, I'll talk about that later on in the call today. But the intent and purpose of this call is to bring together stakeholders in the telehealth world from all over New York State, hear from a uh, speaker every time we have this call, somebody who is having great success in the telehealth world, maybe a subject matter expert, best practice program, and we also hear from our state representative. So we'll have someone from the Department of Health today, uh, someone from the Office of Mental Health and potentially someone from OASAS as well. And then we wrap up the call with some general discussion and an update from myself on the comings and goings in the North Country as it relates to telehealth. Today our agenda is a little bit different as I would like to start with our speaker first. Our speaker today comes from the Center for Connected Health Policy. Um, for those who may not know, the Center for Connected Health Policy develops and advances telehealth policy solutions that promote improvements in health and healthcare systems. They are the state and national resource on telehealth policy issues. They identify policy barriers through research. They provide unbiased policy analysis and recommendations, and they are the uh, creators of the 50 state uh, telehealth report that comes out, I believe, twice a year. Um, and it is a fantastic resource. Their website is cchpca.org. I highly recommend that everybody check out their website to look at what's going on at a national level. Our speaker today is Mei Kwong. She is the executive director for the Center for Connected Health Policy and has been in that role for about seven months. Um, she is going to present to us today on some of the updates at a national level, including what we can expect with the new Medicare um, potential policy changes for 2019. So I'm going to turn it over to May to share her screen and get started on her presentation. 
Thank you, Katie, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Uh, hopefully you are seeing my screen okay. Yes, I can see it. Okay, terrific. So, um, you know, as Katie said, that I am Meg Hall. I'm the executive director here at the Center for Connected Health Policy. I'm also an attorney, so I always start off every talk with a disclaimer. Uh, so any information I provide today is not to be considered legal advice. It's just for informational purposes. CCHP always recommends that you seek an attorney if you want to form a legal opinion. And also, if I happen to show any type of equipment or mention a company, please know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of financial arrangement or affiliation with such a company. So just a little bit of background about CCHP. We actually started off as a California telehealth policy organization. We were founded in 2009 with a grant from the California Healthcare Foundation to really focus in on our own state telehealth policy. But the opportunity to become the National Telehealth Policy Research Center became available in 2012 and through a grant from HRSA, and we applied for that and got it, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. What does that mean? It means we work with 13 other telehealth resource centers to really kind of be your front line on your telehealth questions. So we are all funded underneath the same grant program, um, and the federal government essentially has us out there to provide technical assistance for folks who have questions about telehealth. There are 12 regional resource centers, and they cover specific states. You guys got a great one covering your area, which is the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center. All of them are terrific. Um, if you're not located in that Northeast region, know that there is a telehealth resource center that covers you. Um, there are also two national resource centers, and we're the one on policy, but TTAC, which is based out of Alaska, is the one on technology. So if you have questions about equipment or software, they're the groups to reach out to. But basically, you can contact any of us because all 14 work very closely together and very collaboratively together. So much so that we formed this loose affiliation called the uh, National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. And it's really us trying to work together to decrease inefficiencies, decrease like overlapping or repetitive information, make sure we have this clear, consistent message um, through nationally, although we do have like very regional specific questions as well and answers because each region is different, each state is different. But for those things that are common and go across borders, we try to like have that um, information and that message that gets out there very consistent and accurate. So you can really basically reach out to one telehealth resource center, but you're getting the other 13 to help you. And I always like to say that if one of us can't answer the question, most likely uh, one of the other 13 can. And 99.9% .9 of the time, somebody will have the answer. That 0.1% of the time, somebody will likely go out and research and try to find that answer for you. So, um, federal updates. Actually, it's been kind of an unusual, like I would say about two years, because when we started our role as a National Telehealth Resource Center on policy, things on the federal level moved fairly, fairly slowly and related to telehealth. A lot of the changes um, that happened were very just sort of minimal changes on CMS's side that they introduced every year, and I'll go into that a little bit in more detail. There's usually a lot of legislation that was introduced, but it didn't go anywhere. It sort of stalled in whatever house it was introduced in for, for not because the bill itself was a bad bill, but for whatever reason what was going on in D.C. However, over the last 18 to 24 months, there's actually been a lot of activity. Um, it, it's actually kind of surprising, but when I was pulling these slides together and I sat there and just started listing things, it's like, you know, if you look at them in whole, there's actually been a lot of movement on a lot of different things. Um, maybe a little small movements, but there's been more movement than there has been in previous years. So current legislation that is out there or went into effect fairly recently, most of you have probably heard a lot about bills that have been introduced to address the opioid epidemic. And that's going to be a reoccurring theme throughout this presentation because that is really the big sort of issue that people are looking at right now, not only where telehealth is concerned, but really like how the health system in our uh, country is going to be addressing this really public health crisis. So there have been a lot of bills that have been introduced that have some sort of telehealth element around it. And it's been mainly focused on like where you can receive these services and also on the prescribing it. So for um, 
treating substance use disorder, uh, for those who aren't familiar, just very quickly, one of sort of the gold standard to do that is through medication-assisted therapy, which has two parts to it. There's the medication-assisted side where you prescribe a medication, usually a controlled substance, to essentially wean the person off of whatever they may be addicted to. And then there's the therapy side, which is more counseling, behavioral health, mental health type of counseling therapy. Uh, so many of the policy recommendations or proposals that have been out there, at least where telehealth is concerned, has been focusing more on the counseling, behavioral, mental health side, and using telehealth to to address that issue, to address the substance use disorder issue problem, and how telehealth can work to essentially spread these resources, because there are very limited resources out there right now in addressing um, substance use disorders. So telehealth is being looked to, as it has been in the past, to like really extend what available services are out there. What's been sort of less common as far as the policies, even though there are policies, at least on the federal level, and that's really where the biggest problem is, or the biggest barrier, I should say, not problem, um, is where you're talking about the medication management, where you're talking about prescribing a controlled substance. Currently, where telehealth is concerned, you can only use telehealth is to prescribe a controlled substance in seven very narrow exceptions. Um, and those are, that's underneath federal law, it's the Ryan Hate Act. And that kind of controls, you know, where you use telehealth when you're prescribing these particular types of drugs, which are utilized in this medication-assisted therapy to address um, opioid use disorders. So you really do need the feds to come down with a, um, a, a statutory change in order to like get that loosened up. You know, states can only go so far with it. Controlled substances underneath the federal government or federal statute sort of control there. So there have been a couple of bills that have tried to increase the flexibility within the Ryan Hain Act where you can use telehealth. Um, so and that can mean like you know where the seven exceptions are right now is uh, it needs to take place in certain types of facilities. The patient needs to be in certain types of facilities. So it's like loosening that up a little bit. But also one of the exceptions in underneath the current law is that there would be some sort of registration for doctors in order to use telehealth that the DEA would set up. And that's been on the books actually since the Ryan Hate Act went into effect about 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit less than that. And the DEA hasn't done that. So some of these um, bills have like now a mandate on the DAs, like, you know, get off and start doing this and um, put this like registry in place. So that's what's going on federally with um, a lot of these opioid bills. And when we get to the state stuff, you'll see like that's kind of repeated too on the state level. Um, there's also uh, looking at existing uh, legislation to address some of the barriers that we commonly see on the federal level regarding telehealth, and that's dealing with the Medicare program. Um, those are, a lot of those bills are kind of repeats of what we've seen in the past, like addressing basically the barriers that you see in statute, which is like limitation of where telehealth can take place geographically, and then what type of sites, what type of providers are reimbursed, and what type of services are reimbursed, and what modality you can use. Again, a couple of bills that have been introduced, they're not really moving anywhere, so I don't see any um, movement legislatively on that, but there have been other developments somewhere else. And then there's also been VA legislation in increasing the use of telehealth, more specifically increasing the use of telehealth um, in the home for vets. And one thing that I did want to also point out is that the, there is the RAND ECHO report. Um, that was something that was underneath the CURES Act that was signed basically in the last days of the previous administration, which required Brand to do an examination of the ECHO program. For those who aren't familiar with ECHO, it's sort of like a grand rounds using telehealth where a um, case will be presented by a provider to a panel of um, specific specialists. Um, let's say there's something with um, uh, diabetes, perhaps you're consulting with like panels of endocrinologists or something. And then they will like uh, give their opinion back to, it might be a primary care provider who will go back to uh, their patient and try to treat them that way. So RAND is doing a examination of that because a lot of money has been invested in these types of programs and they're looking at like what has been the results of that. And that report is supposed to come out at the end of this year. So here are a couple examples of the um, proposed legislation that are dealing specifically with some of the telehealth barriers that are in statute. 
Um, you know, as I mentioned, they're looking at like, you know, where telehealth can take place, the type of modalities can be used. There's really hasn't been much movement on any of these bills, so I don't see them as really going anywhere. However, because they're not going anywhere, what we've seen and what's come out recently, oh, and this is just a guidance that CMS is doing on opioids and telehealth, is basically this particular agency, CMS, kind of taking the bull by the horns and trying to to or making their own proposals and basically work around what's in statute. It's sort of like, you know, they're saying to themselves, well, Congress is not changing the law, but we really want to use, see telehealth be used more because we think they can address these issues. How can we work around that? So how they work around it is making a lot of proposals, but not calling them telehealth. So why is that important? If they don't call it telehealth, then those limitations in law don't apply. So they're calling it other things. For example, this started a couple of years ago when they did the chronic care management codes. They did not call those te call that telehealth, but basically when you look at it, it was essentially remote patient monitoring, continuous monitoring of distance, patients at home. Well, if none of that would have worked underneath um, the current laws if you called it telehealth because it needs to be by live video, the patient can be at home. So they called it something else. They called them chronic care management. And they said, these are what, these are the codes that you can build. These are what these uh, codes do. If you're applying that type of service, great. You can like get reimbursed for it. And you're not subject to any of those limitations that are in law around telehealth, such as like you need to be in a rural, specific type of rural area. You need to be in a specific type of health clinic and so forth. This is what they were doing in like their proposed changes for 2019. So for those who aren't familiar, um, every year, like around July, CMS comes out with what they call their proposed changes for the following year of what, what they're doing with their policy. Every year for telehealth, what they have done in the past is just kind of introduced a couple of codes that they were saying, well, we'll start reimbursing for these if you're delivered via telehealth. A couple of years ago, they changed their tactic, tactic, and that was with those chronic care management codes. They started labeling codes as something else other than telehealth to work around the statutory restrictions. This year, they have introduced basically three new areas that they're not calling telehealth, but are, you know, in fact, really telehealth. And that's brief communication technology-based service or virtual check-in, remote evaluation, pre-recorded patient information, and intra-professional internet consultation. So the first one is literally what it's called. It's a brief check-in between patient and provider, where you check in for a few minutes with the patient and see if they need to come in for a visit. Because there's been a lot of times where, you know, if you're following up with a patient, there's not really like a, a need for them to actually come in. And I'll give you a very personal example. One of my brothers had surgery a few months ago. He had an appointment with the surgeon just for, for a check-in. We waited two hours in the waiting room. When we finally got to see the surgeon, we were with him for 10 minutes, and basically he just showed us the MRI my brother had taken, and like we just talked about, didn't examine my brother, did not touch my brother. That probably could have taken place like underneath one of these virtual check-ins. But these virtual check-ins, the providers have not been paid for them. So if you look at it from like, you know, what would be financially beneficial for the provider, of course it'd be like for them to like say to the patient, come in so they get paid for this. Right now, CMS is proposing to, if, you, if you're not, they don't come in for a visit and you do this virtual check-in, we will pay for it. Now, they're not offering a lot. The, the amount that they put on here for this particular virtual check-in was $14 a check-in. But they think it will like help increase um, efficiency and eventually reduce costs because you're avoiding like that actual visit then to the doctor, which is also, which is reimbursed at a higher rate. Remote evaluation of pre-recorded patient information. This is really interesting. This is essentially your storm forward element, but it's patient initiated. So it's not a provider, oh, patient goes into the primary care provider with a rash. The primary care provider doesn't know what it is. They take a picture and they send it. It's not that type of um, connection. It's actually a patient initiated one where the patient says, oh, I have like a rash. They take a picture of it and they send it straight to, to the specialist. So this would be a new code that they would create. Um, I do not know how much of the, this will be reimbursed for. I would think it would be fairly similar to the virtual check-in. They said they would do a crosswalk with a pre-existing code. That pre-existing code, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it paid something like around $12.5. So I'm thinking it's going to be very, fairly similar to the virtual check-in. 
Um, so this is, this is, again, this is like fairly interesting. But this is only for, right now as the proposal stands, for patients who have an established relationship with their provider. So it's, it's not, as the current proposal stands, it is not a new patient reaching out to a, a new provider where there's no existing relationship. They already have a pre-existing relationship for this to happen. But they did ask for comments on what, whether they should open up for certain specialties, such as like dermatology, where there is no pre-existing relationship. The third one is intraprofessional internet consultation, and this is a provider-to-provider -provider consultation. Again, something that really hasn't been paid in the past, where a provider has, you know, said, yeah, you know what, I'm not quite sure about this. I'm going to contact my friend who's a specialist in this area, send them on the information, and they, like, you know, get back to the primary care provider with something, and that usually hasn't been paid. Well, they're now offering to pay something like that. Some of you may have heard the term e-consult. That is basically the idea behind it, where it is a consultation between providers over a secure system, where there's like a great deal of information being sent to the um, to the the specialist. It's it's more of a very formalized, you know, um, elevated curbside consult uh, idea. So there is a call for comments um, on all of these for people to relay your feedback back to, to CMS on it. Um, other things that were in there were back to the substance use disorder, opioid addiction um, crisis. So they were saying they have a call for comments. This is an actual proposal, but a call for comments on developing separate bundle payments for episodes of care related to substance use disorder, which you're using medication-assisted therapy. So. That's not quite a proposal. If they're calling for comments now, that may be a proposal we see in July 2019. A couple of interesting things to note is that um, FQHCs and RHCs were uh, given specific codes, at least for those two proposals, which is the virtual check-in and the asynchronous um, patient-initiated um, consultation. So, if they had not done that, they probably would not have worked for FQHCs and RHCs to be able to bill for it. But they're saying that we will create these codes so that these types of organizations can also be reimbursed for these types of services. One thing to note, they did not mention FQHCs and RHCs in that provider-to-provider -provider proposal. So um, I don't know if that was an oversight or if that was deliberate. My sense is it was probably deliberate. But again, if you are submitting comments, then you may, and that's like an area where you have very strong feelings on, you may want to include that. There was also another, not underneath the physician fee schedule, but another proposal that CMS made actually a few weeks before that, and that was for home health agencies, is to allow them to consider telehealth when calculating administrative costs. So um, again, we're not seeing like sort of legislative actions, at least where federal policy on telehealth is concerned, federal policy underneath Medicare, but we're seeing Medicare making these change administratively and seeing that um, seeing that sort of like shift how these services are reimbursed um, underneath that particular program. Um, we just want to go back really quickly though and mention like when we're talking about this and like CMS is doing these changes, they're I don't think their intention was to redefine telehealth, but in some ways they are doing that. So the term that they use for this is um, communication technology-based services. So that's how they're getting away with that telehealth, um, not using that telehealth label or having that telehealth label apply and all those restrictions by calling it something else. But in a way, that can also start redefining what is telehealth or maybe making the term obsolete as they start going down these different routes in like policy. What are the states doing? Well, the states have always been a little bit more advanced than what the feds have been doing around telehealth policy. But the problem is you've got 51 jurisdictions if you count DC and they all kind of do their own different things. Sort of one way to, um, to see like how different they are is to look at like how they even define the terms telemedicine or telehealth. 45 states have a definition for telemedicine somewhere. 36 states in DC have a definition for telehealth. The reason those numbers are so high, sometimes um, jurisdictions have definition for both. If they have a definition for both, kind of the rough rule of thumb is if they say telemedicine, they mean delivery of healthcare services. If they say telehealth, it's possibly something a little bit broader like education or even remote patient monitoring. 
Alabama has no definition for either. They used to have one in their med excuse me, Medicaid provider manual, but they eliminated that a few years ago. I do not know why, but currently they don't have one that we found on their books. For Medicaid reimbursement, live video, obviously the most um, popular one. There's 49 states in D.C. that have some sort of live video reimbursement that they are explicit about. It is in their provider manual or in regulations or statutes somewhere. Store for rural patient monitoring, a little less popular. Store for was actually stagnant a few years ago. It was at nine for nine states for a while. But over the last couple of years, we've seen an increase in that. A lot of caveats for these. So store for enrolled patient monitoring, there's usually a lot of restrictions. Either it's restricted to like a certain type of specialty, store for, you usually just see it for dermatology and ophthalmology. Um, enrolled patient monitoring, usually to like some sort of chronic condition. You may see the number 23 states for remote patient monitoring sometimes. The reason we put 20 is because we are going by what is um, established Medicaid provider manual policy. And three of the states who do have like in statute or have said that they are starting to reimburse for patient monitoring, they actually don't have that policy out yet. So we, we weren't counting it until that policy is actually out there and we can actually point to the source. And part of that is they're just in the midst of writing it, or I think one state also needed to apply for a state plan amendment, so they're waiting to go through that process. Legislatively, in this past session, it's winding down for a lot of states if it hasn't already. Um, kind of not surprising where you see the bulk of legislation that's been introduced. It's around reimbursement. Licensing is a big thing because of the licensure compacts that are out there. Um, but where we're also seeing like a lot of activity too is um, prescribing and that's related in some ways to the opioid epidemic and how you can, you know, what may be allowed, but also um, making clear of how telehealth plays into that. Here are some common themes, um, allowing schools to be originating sites, um, allowing telehealth to meet network adequacy standards. So uh, these are sort of like, you know, the, um, what we're seeing like, actually a lot for like the 2000, this current legislative session, so, and it's repeated across multiple states. Um, just a couple of bills that are have been approved um, or are in the midst of it, it looks like they will be getting approved. You'll see again that this sort of reflects the trends that we've noted as far as the state. A lot of them are around opioids and starting like a project in some way on using um, telehealth to uh, treat substance use disorder or having in California, there's a bill that's going through the process of like having certain types of counselors eligible for Medicaid reimbursement if they use telehealth um, to treat um, opioid or substance use uh, disorders. So that's kind of, again, like the trend that you see both reflected on the federal level and on the state level as well. And that's it. So thank you. I, I can take some questions because I actually need to jump off a little bit early from the call because I have another call right after this. But I can take some questions now if that's okay. Sure. I have a question from Sean Britton. He said, could the remote evaluation of a pre-recorded patient information cover the situation you described where the primary care provider sends an image to a dermatologist? Uh, no, for that particular, so for that particular proposal that they're saying, it has to be patient initiated. Where okay. they're sending, Thank you. they're sending, yeah, so they're sending it. So basically those two proposals, the virtual check-in and the asynchronous proposal, it, they're, they're offering those as a way to actually avoid a visit. So it would be patient initiated being sent to whatever, their primary care provider, or maybe even their specialist, if they do already have a specialist, and they have to have that pre-existing relationship. And that person will be evaluating it, not like they're sending it to a primary care provider and primary care providers, like sending it to somebody else. Um, and then if, well, okay, so let's say that they send it to their, the patient sends it to the primary care provider and primary care provider sends it to a dermatologist. Will that primary care provider to dermatologist get paid? No. Um, the primary care provider could charge, if the patient does not come in for a visit, could charge for like that, um, you know, per, uh, patient to the primary care provider interaction. Okay. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Anne. It says, on the consultations, is that for a specific patient with a note that is billable to a patient's insurance? 
or is it a generic consultation without an identified patient? I'm not sure I answer, understand the question. So are they thinking, I'm like going back on the slides to see, are they talking about the virtual check-in? Um, I think it's referring to the interprofessional internet consultation. Oh, okay. Could you repeat the question then? So maybe. Yeah, and actually I can, I can unmute the person's line who asked that. And your line is unmuted Hi. if you would like to ask Hi. yourself. Can you hear Hi. me? Can you hear yes. me? Hi. Yes. I'm, I'm Ann Greep, and I'm um, the telemedicine person from Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I'm also an echo um, person as well. And so, you know, the question I'm really saying is, so if um, a primary care doctor decides to call the psychiatrist and talk about a mutual patient, um, that would be a billable service to that patient. Now, what if the, um, the provider wants to call, or I'm seeing here, this is even being applied to internet. What if I want to, um, I'm a primary care, and I send an, uh, a message to somebody saying, um, you know, when it comes to kids, how high do you push an SSRI? Okay. Do you see the difference? Yeah. So I think, and this is part of the problem with this particular proposal. If you go down the three proposals, they went from very specific to a little bit vaguer. <laughs> so right. The interprofessional internet consultation had like a lot of questions and a lot of vagueness in it, which was part of the reason they were asking for so many comments back on it. If you look through the federal register, they were asking like a lot of comments. Okay. I would think your second, and this is just my opinion here, it, it, it might, it would call for a clarification from CMS. I would think like your second scenario probably isn't one that they were thinking of. So it, it is. So just a, so the second one, just a generic, um, gee, I don't know about this, as opposed to a specific this is our mutual patient and I'm worried about a oh. drug interaction. I'm sorry, I think I misheard you. So it was it would be related to a situation though. Okay. I think I may have misheard right. you the first time. Okay, no, no problem. So yeah, if it was related to a specific patient, it might qualify in here. Is is my understanding of that. If you had like Sorry, I'm sorry, were you trying to say something? Or okay. No, we're all still on the line. We do have a oh, lot okay. of questions, so I, I do want to try to move on to the next question, if that's okay. That's fine with me. I was just, just going to end with, I think it probably would apply for this, but I'm going to caution folks. Again, this, is, this was the one proposal where they had a lot of questions on, so it is a little unformulated. In, in how they have, this could possibly change. So just rule it, just sort of like uh, broadly, uh, if you have comments on any of these proposals, they are due September 10th by 5 p.m. and they didn't specify time zone, so think Eastern. 5 p.m., let's just say 5 p.m. Eastern on September 10th, and then kind of where they usually put out their, like their final version of the proposal is around late October. Sometimes they pushed it to early November. Um, and this one may see may undergo some changes based upon like uh, comments that they get back. But it was like sort of the least formed one of the three. Excellent, thank you. I have another question that goes back to the former question from Sean. Sean, your line is open if you would like to ask. Thank you. Just to clarify that a little, and I appreciate you taking the time to answer questions for us. The case of the primary care provider capturing images and send that sending that for a dermatological evaluation, would that potentially be covered by the interprofessional internet consultation? So it could be because, again, you know, yeah, that 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 may be covered by it. I mean, it, it's like technically just like how you laid that out, and that's always been the question with e-consult is like, well, isn't this just store or for? So that's what you're doing. It could come underneath that consultation thing there. But again, I go back to 
they could eventually like how they shape this out where they may prohibit that but that does sound like you know what they've like laid out in the federal register it does sound like it could fall underneath there and then with regards to the second one the remote evaluation of the pre-recorded patient information uh, couldn't the argument be made when the rule guide clarify that if the primary care provider is sending that image on behalf of the patient it is to an extent patient initiated it's just being done on their behalf because it would still uh, alleviate the need for a dermatology visit if the primary care reported all that back to the patient in the first place, right? Um, I don't think they intended it for that. They wanted they they specifically said it was patient initiated, so they wanted the patient to be the one to send it. So my guess is that you probably wouldn't get around that. Maybe. So the thing is with the interprofessional, I didn't have this on my PowerPoint because then we would be getting down into we. There are specific codes they have for the interprofessional which is probably something that should have been up here. Um, I'm going to start showing, sharing my screen again. Let's see if I can, let's see, pause. If I can figure out how to do this, let's see. Uh, there was, let's see. Well, I'm having trouble sharing my screen, but they have specific codes for the interprofessional internet consultation. So those specific codes are interprofessional telephone, um, a series of code, interprofessional telephone assessment and management service provided by a consultative physician, including a verbal and written report, da, 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 and it has like, you know, certain minutes that are involved. And then there's one where basically the primary, what would you say primary care provider can charge, and then another one uh, regarding electronic health records. So I don't think if you're trying to find a workaround of like, you know, the the primary care provider trying to build that store and forward one um, by sending, you know, the, that they receive from the um, patient and then they send the picture and say, well, that one is the store and forward one, that's probably not going to work. They may be able to like build the interprofessional and internet consultation part of it though. So the interprofessional internet consultation is the way to go for provider to provider? Well, it's your only way to go. Okay. Thank it's you. It's your only way to go because the other two are patient to provider. And you would need to, there's only six codes that they're, they're proposing. You would need to, your situation would need to fall within the definition of those six codes. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. If you guys are interested, CCHP did do an in-depth analysis of that fact sheet is on our, our website. I can forward that to Katie and she can share, or maybe I can just put it in here in the message. So that's what I was trying to share screen with. So I've like put the link to the fact sheet on there. And we've got a quick yeah, you sort of- send that to me and I will put it in the meeting notes too. Okay, yeah, I have it in the chat and we also have, this is, that's, the in-depth analysis, which is the first link that I put in the chat box, and then in the second, the second link I'm sending is more of like kind of a quick reference, um, a quick reference yeah, type make, of fashion. Yeah, make sure you send that to everyone because I think it just went to organizers. So if you switch your to it, the entire audience, everyone will see it. So our next okay. question is from. Harita, Harita, I'm going to unmute your line so you can go ahead and ask your question. Great, thank you. So along the same lines, for the remote evaluation of the pre-recorded patient information, you mentioned that it has to be an established provider. Is that the same exact provider or can be an established provider within the same group, like practice group? It just says established patient provider relationship. So if the patient provider relationship exists for the entire practice group, then it could be a provider in there. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. That, now, one thing, one proposal, one comment that they that did mention in that particular proposal was they do want people to give their feedback on are there specialties where it could be a new relationship where there doesn't have to be an established relationship, such as like dermatology. They do want feedback on that from folks. That was not in the proposal, but they want comments back from people on that. Great, thank you so much. 
Excellent. The next question is from Will. Will, your line is unmuted. Uh, thank you. This is Will Irwin. Can a patient ask a doctor to, to, who he has a relationship to send an uh, x-ray image or other test data that he has to a telephysician for evaluation, for remote evaluation? And the, I presume that the telephysician would get uh, uh, would get paid. Mm, no, I don't think that was the purpose of what this particular proposal was. That scenario was not listed, in, so I do not think that scenario would probably apply to this. Again, th again, th this proposal for the main purpose behind this proposal, it looks like for CMS to try to avoid a visit. So it would probably, again, probably that type of situation would probably fall more into if it was the, the third proposal, which is that professional to professional patient. Thank you. Excellent. Next question is from Emily Sasser. Emily, your line is unmuted. Hi, thank you. Uh, I also have a question about the remote evaluation of pre-recorded patient information. It, does this only apply to patient information like it, like an image or video, or might it also apply to the completion of an online questionnaire like the uh, e-visit that's becoming more and more popular? Ah, so this was one thing that we were not clear on and actually pointed out when we did the analysis, is we, we were like, well, what exactly do they mean by this pre-recorded this pre-recorded information, are they including things such as email as well? And it was not clear. It was not clear in okay. thing. And it was one thing that we actually flagged, saying like there was there wasn't quite because they mention it sort of early on when they're talking in general, but then they don't really talk about it in their proposal that they offer. So it is not clear in there, and that is one thing that needs to probably be highlighted when people do comment. And. I, I was just as a follow up question, I know that there have already been there are already some codes and reimbursement for specific remote patient monitoring, but did they say whether or not um sort of the ambient collection of data um through remote patient monitoring does that is that is that um considered to be patient um generated or is like for, for this? No, they did, they did not do any type of cross okay. walk or linking to those things, no. All right, thanks. Excellent, and I have one last question. Um, I am not able to unmute Heather's line, but her question is, do you see that medication-assisted therapy will be expanded, and will it include pharmacists as billable providers? And with that last question, will it include pharmacists as billable providers? Yes. It's not going to be expanded underneath the, 2000, the current year 2019 proposal because where that medication-assisted therapy um, section came in when I was talking about that on my PowerPoint, that was only sort of a you know call for comments. They were not offering an actual proposal. So where, where that's concerned, that's still... You're, you're not going to see it in 2019. However, they'll probably come out with a proposal in July of 2019 for to 2020. Um, so at this point, you know, pharmacists have not entered the discussion on there. But but the thing is, is like that was just sort of, hey, give us your ideas on like you know what what we're thinking here with medication assisted therapy. So there's there's an opportunity, I think, to to expand sort of like that range or that ring of like eligible providers. Okay, thank you. And then the last one is, I know we will be getting slide copies, but can we get a list of the codes? I think that both are the links that you sent out, correct? Right, they are in our fact sheet. And also what we did was we did a fact sheet, which is I think like eight pages long, which is an in-depth analysis, but we also have a sort of like kind of one page one page kind of quick reference sheet which lists the code specifically though they, they're not defined. So you really want to use the two of them. One's just sort of a quick reference when you're more familiar with the material. The other one is the in-depth analysis. Perfect. And I will send those out with the meeting notes everyone so rest assured you will get that information. Um, that's the last of the questions. Thank you so much for all this information. It was very helpful. You actually um, got us to our max number of attendees. It's the most attendees we've ever had on this learning collaborative. So very popular topic, and I thank you.
So, well, thanks CMS. They were the ones that came up with their proposals about 10 <laughs> days ago. <laughs> it's nice to have someone summarize it for us, though. It can be confusing to tackle all of that language, so I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, and everybody have a great day. Likewise. All right. Um, next up on the agenda, I know she has to go very soon, but Megan, I've unmuted your line if you would like to give a brief update on the pending New York State Medicaid update. Yes. Hi, everyone. This is Megan Procorum. I'm with the New York State Department of Health. I actually sit on the regulatory side of the department, separate from the Medicaid program, but I am I help to coordinate some of our response and questions about um, telehealth, including the telehealth parity law. So we have a, a parity law in New York State, which has amended insurance law and public health law. Insurance law would affect our commercial payers, and then uh, public health law uh, affects what uh, the statutory uh, oversight of the Medicaid program. So. Um, so when May was talking about um, statute versus policy, uh, we've had some exciting uh, changes to our statutes for a public health law this past legislative session, where for the Medicaid program, the originating site or where the patient is located was expanded to include uh, basically anywhere the patient is. So it can include the patient can be at home or any other temporary location outside of New York State for um, a Medicaid patient. It also expanded our um, list of eligible telehealth providers for the Medicaid program to include uh, KSACs. These are credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselors that are credentialed by OASAS. And then it also included uh, authorized providers of the early intervention program pursuant to um, Article 25 of Public Health Law, and it also includes early intervention uh, service coordinators. Um, so two very uh, big changes. And then, so as Katie mentioned, uh, we are uh, waiting with bated breath the release of our policy guidance for Medicaid for telehealth. Um, originally, we had anticipated it being out this month, but it was had to be pushed back. We now anticipate it being in August. So once it is um, released, I'll make sure to send it to Katie so that folks can, uh, you know, uh, take a, a look at it. It will include all of our definitions uh, for telehealth and for the Medicaid program, um, including the three different applications being store and forward, remote patient monitoring, which also got a definition expansion under statute, and then also, and then lastly, telemedicine. Um, and like I said, the, the full expanded list of telehealth providers, uh, it'll speak a little bit on um, things to note in terms of confidentiality, patients' rights, and consent. Uh, and then also, it will go into more specific instruction on how to bill for these services, including updates to different modifiers to use. So um, once that's released, like I said, we'll get that out to as large an audience as possible, and hopefully I can, um, we can um, present that to the group at a later date. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. We will definitely look forward to seeing that. Um, I did get one question that popped in. Can the Medicaid patient be located in the home for urgent care as an originating site? And also, will store and forward be covered by Medicaid? So uh, to answer the second question, yes, store and forward will be covered, and there'll be specific uh, uh, instruction on on the billing and the rate for that in the guidance that'll be coming out. And then, so yes, the patient can be located in the home and receive urgent care services as long as that uh, the provider is eligible. Uh, so it would have to be one of a specific type, which is fairly comprehensive. It includes physicians, PAs. NPs. Um, it would not include a registered professional nurse for an urgent care visit. Um, RNs can be an eligible telehealth provider for remote patient monitoring. Um, uh, so, but that urgent care provider would have to be a, a you know licensed to practice in New York State, and they would also have to be a part of the Medicaid and enrolled provider in Medicaid. Excellent. And do you anticipate that guidance coming out early August or late August or still not sure? Still not sure. I anticipate from what I've been seeing, the updates are coming out at the 
end of the month. So July has not yet been posted yet. So I do anticipate it being at the later part of the month. Okay. And is there going to be anything in this new guidance addressing SQHCs and how they can't still bill as a distance site? There will be specific guidance for FQHCs. They do have a, a specific section, and um, any FQHCs that want to get in touch me, with me to talk more about that um, in depth, um, they can. And they can um, either you know reach me through Katie or also send uh, an email to telehealth at health.ny.gov. There's a lot of confusion Excellent. about FQ. Yeah, a lot of. I want to acknowledge the fact that you know FQHCs are uh, in a in a, a different uh, kind of category, and there's a lot of confusion, and we want to help clarify that. Perfect. And then the last question that just came through is: Can a patient be located outside of New York State and see a doctor remotely who is only licensed in New York State? Right. So if that um, it, it, for is it. it for Medicaid, I'm just going to speak on Medicaid right now. Um, I'm not sure if that question refers to that or not. So if the if the Medicaid patient is outside of New York and receives telehealth services from a licensed uh, Medicaid provider that's licensed in New York State, they can receive reimbursement through Medicaid for that. Yes. Okay, perfect. That was the last of the questions. I know you have to go. So thank you so much for staying on the line and giving us that important update. And just so everyone's aware, I know we don't have another learning collaborative until mid-September, but if the guidance comes out before then, you will be getting an email from me with that specific language. All right. Thank you, so Katie. next up Bye. on our agenda, thanks, Megan. I have Amy Smith from OMH. If, she, if OMH has any updates to provide, Amy, your line is unmuted. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, we just have some brief updates to follow up really on what Megan talked about with some changes to the statute. And we've come up with a list of recommendations and some proposed changes that we would like to make to our regulation. They're currently sitting with our council's office awaiting um, approval and to kind of figure out the language that we want to change for the regs. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is uh, look to add pros as an allowable treatment setting. Up to now, it's been um, excluded from a treatment setting. We're also looking to extend our eligible practitioners to go beyond the psychiatrist and psychiatric nurse practitioners. So we're looking to include um, licensed clinicians, the psychologists, social workers, licensed mental health counselors. Um, we're also looking, probably our biggest change is going to be that we're looking to incorporate uh, that the spoke site can now include the client's home um, as, you know, kind of already changed by statute. Um, so, you know, anywhere that the client is going to be sitting within New York State and also some temporary locations outside of New York State. So we see possibly like a college setting or if somebody is visiting family for an extended period of time, um, that would be considered an eligible visit. And we're also looking to expand where the practitioner can sit. So for the psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners, um, they may be located outside of New York State, uh, as long as they are, you know, New York State Medicaid enrolled provider and New York State licensed provider, um, they can sit outside of the state. So those are our biggest updates that we're looking to change in regulation and we're hoping for um, early fall. That's excellent. Um, that will be great to have those two agencies really mirror, mirror each other in terms of regulations and statutes. So that will open up a lot of opportunities for behavioral health providers. So thank you for providing that information. There, there are no questions that came through. So thank you, Amy. Yep, you're welcome, Katie. Yep, you're welcome. So there isn't anybody on the line from OASAS, but last I heard from them, they didn't have any real updates at this time. Um, I am going to share my screen briefly for an update that I have, so just bear with me. Um, I just have to make myself a presenter. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So what you'll see up here is the invite to the 4th Annual North Country Telehealth Conference. I'm sure many of you saw the invitation went out um, about two weeks ago. The theme this year is virtual care in a value-based world, and we are adding a pre-conference session this year. 
That is sponsored by the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center. The pre-conference session this year is going to have two separate components. It will start off with a presentation from Andrew Solomon and myself. Andrew is from the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center and is truly a subject matter expert for the region as it relates to telehealth and implementation. Um, there'll be a brief break and then we have uh, healthcare lawyers from Hooper, Lundy, and Bookman coming in from Boston to talk about um, operationalizing telemedicine from a legal and regulatory perspective. So the pre-conference is going to sell out. I've capped it at probably about 100, and we're about a quarter of the way through registration on that. So if you are interested in attending this event, you will want to register um, soon. The full conference is going to be on Thursday, November 8th starting at 8 a.m. and ending probably around 3.30, that might change. Our keynote speaker this year is Dr. Raul Vasquez. He is the CEO of the Greater Buffalo United Accountable Care Organization and Independent Practice Association. He is an expert in value-based payment and how telehealth can be a key player in that transition. And we will, of course, be bringing back the afternoon plenary session where you will have a panel of both Megan who just spoke, Amy Smith, who just spoke, and then um, Sarah Osborne from OASAS. So they will be there for a 90-minute panel talking about the um, current regulations, future regulations, the Medicaid update, some of the changes that Amy just spoke about, and they'll be there to answer your questions as well. And as you can see on the screen, there are a number of exciting breakout sessions, including uh, teleretinopathy, uh, telehealth to fight the opioid epidemic, uh, Project ECHO, and then Critical Care Telemedicine. So again, you'll want to go to um, either ahihealth.org or telehealthny.org. Both websites have links to registration, or just send me an email and I can shoot you the link right away. This conference will absolutely sell out ahead of time, so please, please register if you want to attend. That was the only update that I had. So I will give you back a few minutes of your day. If you have any questions about today's session, please send me an email. I'm kcook, K-C-O-O-K, -K, at ahihealth.org. I will be sending out the slides and recording likely tomorrow morning, so look forward to that and share that with your colleagues. If you have questions for May, please send them my way, and I will make sure that I get those answered in a timely fashion for you. Um, otherwise, have a fantastic week and a fantastic Monday. Thank you.